Hello and welcome everybody to the fourth Grand Rounds. Um, the previous Grand Rounds that people have been asking us are available uh, on the Gold Gosh Learning Academy YouTube channel. Um, so you can log on that through the internal website and see that certainly the first two are up now and the third one will go up in the next few days for you to watch um, at your leisure. Um, as always, we're going to mention that we can get CME points have been recognized by the RCPCH. So you can self-credit for your one CME points. That's 45 minutes of educational time and 50 minutes of reflection. Now, if you want an attendance to forget, as some people do, you can um, put your name um, on the uh, SurveyMonkey feedback tool that comes up at the end of the session. Um, you can give us some feedback and then if you put your name in then we can send you an attendance certificate if you request it. So we've got quite a big panel today um, which has been put together by Lee Hudson and from the Psychological and Mental Health Services and we were just talking a bit earlier before we came online that it's actually Mental Health Awareness Week this week so it's um, of course we've planned this exactly so they present on Mental Health Awareness Week. A slick as a well oiled machine that PGMA is. Um, it wasn't like a tool that this has happened. So Lee Hudson, I think, well known to the consultant staff. Um, he's a clinical associate professor at, at, at ICH and a consultant general pediatrician here at GOSH. He's also chief officer of mental health here at Great Ormond Street. And he's got together a multidisciplinary team of um, psychological mental health experts to take us through uh, how they're meeting the challenges of uh, mental health effects on children during this time of COVID-19. Okay, so over to you, Lee. Okay, thank you for that. So um, it is Mental Health Awareness Week. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And I hope you're looking after your own mental health because it's been um, a very interesting time. T the focus is more today is going to be on the acute crisis presentations that Gosh has taken on. I'll talk about that in a, in a little while. Um, there are a whole, before we even start, though, there are lots of people here who are going to talk about this in their small bits, but we really just need to... Um, to thank the massive numbers of people that have been involved with these admissions from general paediatric team, nurses on the wards, um, HCAs, everybody has been involved with these patient security CSPs. It's been um, an interesting time, but we're very grateful for everyone and they're not forgotten during this presentation. Um, so it will affect children in lots of different ways. And, children. It will affect children in lots of different ways. and, um, and what we do know from before COVID was that mental health was very common in children and young people. So um, one in eight children have a mental health disorder in, the, in England, and over a third of children living in families with the least healthy functioning had a mental health disorder, and nearly three quarters had a physical health condition. So when you get to girls aged 17 to 19, it's almost a quarter of um, those young people that have a mental health disorder, and half of them have reported suicidal self-harm. So the big concern for everyone nationally and that includes all of our patients and the patients uh, in our neighbourhood, is that we have pre-existing high levels of mental health. And just a reminder that data on deaths in children are really compelling about the importance of mental health. So if you look at that 15 to 19 age group, of which 20% of deaths in children are accounted for, a big chunk of that, over half, are represented by accidents, assault, abuse, um, suicide and substance abuse. So what do we know nationally? Actually, surprisingly, we don't know that much. And the problem has been, of course, that children and young people and their families have diligently been in lockdown and behind closed doors. And we know that referrals to CAMS have gone down. We know that um, seeking for healthcare across all of paediatrics has gone down. So we've got this real concern that there are patients and, and families who are really suffering out there. We're going to talk in a minute about some of the acute crises that are presented to us. There is research going off. Um, GOSH has uh, just got a GOSH charity grant to start looking at how our existing families and children are affected by um, COVID-19 and also my research group at UCL were involved with studying 16 to 24 year olds and just got around a thousand young people involved with that study. So what's GOSH been doing? Well importantly GOSH has been doing its business as usual because that's been really important. So it's important that that business happens. It's been done more remotely because we've been able to help and support children and young people and their families um, not having to get into crisis. Um, but we've also been part of the new general paediatric admissions, which is what we're going to talk about. And you will all know that we've taken general paediatric admissions from across NCL through North Central London. And a number of that uh, workload has been people with acute presentations because actually that's what general paediatrics often is. Um, a large part of presentations are mental health presentations and children are frequently admitted to, uh, to wards and we've been doing that and that's been new work for us and of course we've been providing that psychosocial support. I think 
before I move on, the real observation for me, as well as the, the work that's gone into this, is just how important it is that GOSH delivers mental health care for its patients, because you'll see from the patients that we've been seeing during this period, where we've been carrying some of the workload with our NCL colleagues, the, the issues that we particularly have to deal with, which is mental health in the context of medical conditions, medically unexplained, and the well-being for children who've got long-standing conditions, there just isn't space for that at the moment. And we're really worried that when lockdown comes down, we're going to see a flood of referrals to CAMS and our partners are going to be very busy. And so we need to make sure that we provide that service. Just to, before we go on an overview, we've, this is data from last week. We've had 31 admissions for 28 patients. And 21% of those were under the Mental Health Act, which we've had to change what we do through the CQC. Um, and that has required a ratio of nurses um, that we've not been used to before. And one of those patients has been COVID. So I'm going to pass us on now to John Golden, who's going to talk to us about the um, work we've been doing with our NCL partners for mental health. Hi, Lee. Um, I hope that you can all see this. Um, so I'm John Golden. I'm a consultant child psychiatrist and the co-specialty lead for PAMS. Um, and I just want to talk generally about the really good work that's been going on uh, across NCL. So as people will know, as part of the COVID-19 surge planning, Great Ormond Street, we agreed to take paediatric patients from all the acute trusts in NCL. So the Whittington, the Royal Free Hospital, UCLH, Barnet General and North Mid, they've all closed their paediatric wards. They, some of them may be reopening in the future, we'll, we'll come on to that maybe, but they've closed their paediatric wards. So we agreed uh, to take those patients and uh, the local hospitals were closing the wards particularly to make adult patient, uh, space for adult patients with COVID. So the A&Es have remained open, however, and the system needs to move as much mental health crisis work out of the A&E as possible. So there were two crisis hubs that have been developed away from A&E sites to reduce the crisis presentations, and those two crisis hubs are in Barnet and also the Northern Health Centre in Islington. So the idea is that patients with mental health difficulties present at these hubs. The idea is that they don't present as far as possible to A&E. And if they've got comorbid medical problems or they need to be admitted to a paediatric ward, then they will come uh, to Great Ormond Street. Now, many young people um, who present in mental health crisis, as we know, also have additional physical health needs. Um, so, uh, and they may require an admission. So they may also require a, a temporary bed. Uh, and sometimes there are social care admissions or tier four inpatient placement is sought. Uh, and these are all reasons why they might come to Great Ormond Street rather than their local paediatric ward. So what have we done at Great Ormond Street? Um, we've created additional bed capacity for short stay patients um, and these were made available to the NCL system for paediatric patients including those who, who may have mental health needs. Initially they won Sky Ward uh, for the first few weeks. We had scoped out uh, Kingfisher Ward um, and in the last week or so we've opened up six beds on Kingfisher Ward. So patients come in under the general paediatricians with support from the CAM psychiatrists, UCLH and Great Ormond Street and also the mental health nurses. Um, the Mildred Creek unit also provides beds if a mental health inpatient admission is needed. So on the MCU normally we take seven to 14 year olds, uh, we have up to 10 places, but we've been more flexible in the last few weeks uh, due to the COVID crisis. And we've currently, for example, got a 16 year old uh, on our ward. Uh, so we are taking patients from Kingfisher who may need a, a, a tier four inpatient admission. And there's also two other tier four units uh, in North London, Simmons House and, um, and the Beacon Centre who can also take patients as needed. So we're doing a lot of work. We have been doing a lot of work with the wider NCL system to make these pathways work. Um, and we've also, uh, as Lee mentioned, linked with the CQC uh, to register GOSH to accept patients under the Mental Health Act. Matt Shaw and the executive were very helpful with that. And there were some last minute calls, I think it was before the Easter weekend, to make sure that that could happen effectively. So this is an example of the pathway. I mean, there's, there's a few pathways that have been developed uh, for outside Great Ormond Street and also coming into Great Ormond Street. And obviously, I'm not expecting you to read all of that. Um, but basically, uh, the idea is that the patients are assessed in the local hubs, uh, they're risk assessed. Uh, if they can be managed in the community, that's great. If they need an inpatient admission, then the, ne the NCL uh, CAM psychiatrist, consultant child psychiatrist, will speak to the Great Ormond Street child psychiatrist and discuss the risk assessment, uh, discuss issues around um, 
whether uh, the patient needs to be managed one to one or two to one or three to one, um, and then um, uh, they will get admitted as appropriate. So in terms of future plans, um, there, is, uh, there was an external review by the NCL uh, CAMS team on the 6th of May uh, 2020, and there was positive feedback obtained and there were helpful recommendations uh, that they made. So for example, the team were extremely impressed with the amount uh, that has been achieved in a very short space of time. Uh, the GOSH team and service have been extremely adaptive, responding to challenges in a thoughtful and creative way. This is what uh, we were told. Uh, by them. And I'd also like to echo Lee's thanks, particularly uh, for our general paediatric colleagues, our nursing colleagues, um, and also our psychiatry colleagues. So UCLH, um, uh, Jake and Mike have been extremely helpful as well. Um, so uh, just to finish off, say the future plans are uncertain. Uh, we're waiting to hear about plans to possibly reopen some paediatric wards in the NCL sector. Um, and Matt said he will let us know in the next uh, day or so what the, what the likely plans going forward are. And similarly, we're likely to uh, need the GOSH service as part of the NCL pathway in the medium term, for example, over the next uh, four to six months. Let's move on. Hi there. OK. Um, hope you can see that OK and hope you can hear me OK. Um, so we're going to, uh, myself and Octavia, are going to talk about uh, CAMS crisis nursing at GOSH and give the nursing perspective. Okay, so thinking about the pathway um, to begin with, um, it was important for us that there was a strong nursing voice uh, from the beginning and our priorities were that there would be clear communication uh, and ownership of the process, both from a nursing perspective and from a trust perspective, uh, that there be an active nursing role in all parts of the process to safeguard patients and staff, um, that capacity and acuity wouldn't be breached and from a nursing point of view, um, given that we're kind of here uh, every day, we'd be able to kind of keep uh, a close eye on that. Um, we also had a real strong priority that uh, the Mildred Creek unit would remain open uh, to current patients, many of whom had to go home uh, to have treatment remotely at very short notice, um, and also that we could uh, create capacity to support uh, the flow of patients. What we didn't want to happen is that MCU got full up uh, straight away, uh, and then we'd be, we'd be no good to anyone. Um, we identified a ward where patients could be treated uh, while staff team uh, were supported and trained up. Um, we identified um, Kingfisher Ward um, due to flow and acuity elsewhere. Um, mental health patients in the beginning were popping up on different wards, so we were supporting uh, different teams, uh, both in the moment and with training. And we've now uh, moved to a model where we are on Kingfisher Ward and we're able to consolidate in terms of our treatment um, and our training. So the nursing role, we uh, facilitate daily uh, huddle meetings uh, with the network, with those professionals uh, listed uh, there. Um, each patient on Kingfisher is allocated a GOSH paediatric nurse and a member of the MCU nursing team. Um, this is to take a holistic approach uh, around physical care liaison, uh, planning, risk management and therapeutic uh, intervention. Uh, we also take an overview of staffing. Um, so we had an agreement with uh, NCL that from uh, the central COVID budget would have two um, registered mental health nurses to begin with. Uh, we eventually uh, moved this to four and now we've got six um, per shift, that's day and night. And now we're on Kingfisher and able to manage that increased capacity. Um, we also have daily planner meetings uh, with the nursing team on the unit. Um, we think about training the mental, mental Health Act, which Octavia will go through a bit more. We monitor capacity, uh, acuity, and, and also liaison with the professional network, um, ensuring that we communicate to the network daily uh, what we're able to manage as, as a ward and, and as a trust. Um, and we're also involved in admission um, through to discharge uh, planning. So just some of the challenges I uh, want to kind of focus on before I hand over to Octavia is that uh, we're dealing with presentations that the trust are not used to managing. Um, this presents clinical uh, challenges for all of us and also high levels of anxiety um, throughout the system. And with that level of anxiety can you know, come very difficult conversations and that can kind of feed into a bit of a blame culture at times as well. So we've really had to kind of work through that. And uh, we're also doing this against the backdrop of COVID. So if we think about sort of nursing team at the minute, we've got nurses who are used to working in a speciality. They've been moved around different wards and um, they're working across different teams um, under a lot of stress. And alongside that, as individuals, they're also having to think about sort of coming in and 
the stresses of COVID and what that might mean for the families as well. So it, it's a lot. Um, that can lead to staff feeling uh, displaced and burnt out. Uh, we also have the issue that nursing staff from NCL were pulled back to their trust. So we thought we were going to get um, paediatric nurses with experience of uh, working with acute mental health um, patients, but because of uh, flow and acuity back in their hospitals, they were kind of pulled back. So that presented problems. Uh, working across uh, teams internally and across the network, um, has often been tense, but that's something that we've been working really hard on. Um, and that can create pressures from inside the trust and externally, a lot of pressures to admit when it's not kind of doesn't feel safe to do so. And also pressures inside the trust about how we're kind of managing uh, these patients. Some of the ways we've mitigated these challenges, we ensure that systems are in place to support staff and patients around the clock. This includes GOSH on-call psych, nursing on-call, and we have things like an escalation flow chart so people know who to contact. Um, we do a lot of training, which again, Octavia will uh, cover. Uh, very honest and open in our communication around what's going on at the moment. Um, and we make sure that alongside constructive feedback, we also give each other uh, plenty of positive feedback to kind of keep each other going. And the message that we really um, want to send as, um, so a message that we really want to send to everyone and we've been trying to send is that everyone's best is more than good enough at the minute. Uh, we're all out of our comfort zones. We're all kind of doing what we can um, and everyone's best is, is more than good enough. It's an important part of our role to articulate pressures on the nursing team uh, to see senior people within the trust um, and with in the network and vice versa we also need to articulate pressures on the trust and the system to the nursing team as well and kind of take that kind of broker position um, and we also make sure that we've got a, a secure system in place to monitor um, the flow and, and, and the acuity whilst increasing air capacity safely and like I said making sure that we communicate that um, to the network so I'm now going to hand over to Octavia um, who's going to do uh, the next bit so I can just great um, I'm Octavia so I work as the CAMS practice educator I'm just going to touch on a little bit around kind of the training and education that we've done in order to look after these patients coming through GOSH um, so a big part of, of looking after young people who've presented in an acute mental health crisis has been doing lots of kind of formal and informal teaching and training what we started with really was thinking about what it meant to be providing kind of one-to-one -one care to these young people. Um, we know that this was something that was really new to kind of our paediatric colleagues um, and actually understanding what it meant to look after a young person on one-to-one -one for their mental health and knowing what can be expected of RMNs who are coming in to do that as well as kind of paediatric staff working within that as well. Um, alongside that we've done regular teaching around de-escalation and breakaway technique. Um, we know that this is something that can cause a lot of anxiety within, um, within the teams. One of the kind of biggest worries is about what to do if there's an escalating situation in someone's aggression or violence. Um, so we felt it was really important to address this right from the start um, and kind of start having those conversations and, and give people technique um, to use. The feedback from that is that people have been really pleased to kind of know that there's something to be following, that there's specific training around kind of what to do in these situations. Um, alongside that, we've thought about common law um, within kind of the nursing team and NDT and trying to dispel some of the myths around um, who can kind of get involved in an escalating situation. Um, we've done regular teachings around different clinical skills that might be needed um, within a kind of a setting where you're caring for young people with mental health needs. So this is including um, things like using ligature cutters um, and how to give injections correctly. Um, and another part of what we've seen as a really important aspect of kind of nursing these young people with acute mental health crisis is safety planning. Um, and thinking about their therapeutic interventions. This is something that we've done with our MCU nursing staff, but also with the paediatric nurses on the ward. Um, and there's been some really great working where actually paediatric nurses and MCU staff have been able to work together to create a safety plan with the young person. This has been new for kind of both sets of teams in terms of doing that sort of work. So we've done lots of kind of formal and informal training around that. Um, and I suppose thinking about kind of, I think our biggest part of training has been has been the Mental Health Act, um, which I'll come on to now. Um, so just thinking about the training that we've done around that. Um, so we, as we know, this has been a really 
big um, and new part of kind of caring for young people at Great Ormond Street is working with young people who are detained under the Mental Health Act. Um, so this has included young people who have been sectioned um, under Section 2 and Section 3, as well as kind of being able to use holding powers to keep young people in hospital um, for a period of time to decide whether they need to be assessed under the Mental Health Act. So we've done lots of work around helping the nursing staff to understand what it means to be caring for a young person who's detained and making sure that that young person is receiving the right care um, and that they're kept as safe as possible. Um, alongside this, as I'm sure there'll be lots of people that know, there's lots of um, legal kind of processes to follow, which can feel a, like a lot of information. And um, so we've done, again, quite a lot of informal and formal training around what some of these processes mean, um, how to kind of keep paperwork safe, how to make sure that if a young person is being transferred to a mental health unit under section of the Mental Health Act, how to make sure that this happens correctly um, so that it's as smooth as possible for the young person and the staff involved. We've also had lots of liaison with the Camden Mental Health Act office um, and we continue to kind of be really involved with them thinking about whether we're following kind of processes correctly. Um, and yeah, we continue as a sort of nursing team to be doing formalised training around how um, we can scrutinise papers. So that currently sits with the uh, Mildred Creek nursing team and just kind of bringing their confidence up around um, scrutinising mental health act paperwork, again, to make sure that the young person is being looked after in the safest way. So with that, I'll hand back to Lee, if that's OK. OK. Thanks, everybody. Um, I think we're about ready to hand over to, to questions, Jonathan, but I was just, just wanted to reflect a bit on, you know, this This has been a, a unique period of time for Great Ormond Street and the teams and also the teams who've come to work with us. Um, we, we've really benefited, benefited from that. But I think those cases show and that, that work shows how much effort's gone into making things work differently. But, you know, the stuff that we've been able to provide for families and patients where we've been able to provide mental health support and also that medical support combined it's really been something new and really good in my view you know if a, ch a child young person was in another general pediatric unit potentially and they needed an mri because in so some cases we've needed to make sure there wasn't another medical presentation you know we've been able to get plastic surgery operations done we've been able to get mris done it's really been a huge team effort of putting body and mind together that i think we need to really carry on with in terms of understand how we work together for our patients moving forward i mean neil bulstrode made made sure that i mentioned that he got on his moped and went up to the Royal free at one point to actually or the whittington sorry to actually do an operation for a patient that we didn't have capacity to bring down so it's been you know body and mind work um, professionals really working together which is something i'm really proud of and proud of everyone that's been involved with that yeah thanks very much lee and thank you to everyone um all the presenters um a fascinating area um and something we don't hear much about or not enough of i think at great Ormond streets and so if all the panel of people that want to take the turn, turn on their videos but mute their mic for now and then lee can then suggest people can fill these questions we've had a few questions come through i mean i think that Lee was just just alluding to the fact that it's actually a very positive thing having these patients here at Great Ormond Street from their point of view, because we can give them a holistic care, medical and um, mental health wise. But do you think there's been any positive um, positive for the hospitals wide for having these patients at, at Gosh for us as staff and a hospital as an institution? Um, well, why don't I ever go at the first one then? I I, I think yes. Um, I think we've made huge. Um, strides anyway at Great Ormond Street in the last few years in terms of um, incorporating mental health and physical health together. Um, we've already got really good well-established mental health teams here that work, you know, we've got a psychologist embedded in every medical team and we've got a, a world-class um, service and we've got an inpatient unit for younger children. So we've already, already done that. So I think it's shown that those teams can step up to the mark, but also it's just brought home to us how important um, mental health is we work with our partners i think we'll walk away from this our, our partnerships with our our um ncl buddies i always joke and laugh it's been like being at someone's wedding working in general peds in the last um six weeks because i've worked with and seen everyone i've worked with for the last 20 years and lots of different trainees so i think there'll be positives in relationships and we've we've shown we can quickly manage risk safely and really carefully in a, in a quick way and that's been you know, brought brought teams together and that's not to say that it hasn't been hard and difficult for lots of people because of course it has so i think that and, and i think it just the last thing to say it brings home that final point that if this is what ncl are dealing with on a regular basis you know the cams teams community teams and you know i need to say that because these teams are and the uclh team deal with patients like this all the time they brought their expertise to us and brought something together 
we, we need to take responsibility for our own patients and their mental health. You know, the, the, the medical and explain presentations, the, the well-being of our patients is so imperative that we do that because there isn't the capacity. And I suspect there won't be capacity for some years as we come out of lockdown that we need to hold that. OK, great. Um, and another question is, did, what, what do you think the main challenge looking after COVID positive patients are from the point of view of sort of communication? They're thinking about where you have to wear face masks, the children more distressed by the way we're doing things at the moment and our appearances um yeah um john do you want to speak to that in terms of from the ward yeah no I, I, absolutely i mean in, in terms of sort of you know patients who are presenting with covid um you know from a kind of staff point of view there were obviously um a lot of anxieties around that but in terms of sort of the backdrop of covid at the minute i mean you know it, it presents significant um challenges as it does throughout the hospital you know sort of children who are coming in only being allowed kind of one visitor um, at a time at the moment, um, you know, nursing and um, children uh, wearing masks uh, when they're already uh, a very acute um, state and um, feeling very distressed. Um, you know, we're not able to kind of interact in that kind of close proximity um, as we normally would. Um, and I think, you know, sort of everyone's done an absolutely amazing job, but I think it's important just to add into that that you know staff are at a point when they're sort of very stressed at the moment and there's a lot going on as well and when sort of you know our, our treatment so much involves um therapeutic use of ourselves uh, and how we interact um, with our patients i think that definitely kind of feeds into things at the minute and how we're able to support each other and how we're able to uh, to work together so i think definitely that from a nursing point of view i can see that mike's uh, got his hand up there so it'd be really great to hear from from him what, what his point of view is. Mike, do you want yeah. to introduce yourself as well? Sorry. Yeah, so I'm Mike Grossman. I'm a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist and liaison psychiatrist at UCH. I've been working here for the last, uh, well, since general paediatrics has got here. So just to, or oh, 10 weeks, sorry, you lose track when you're having fun. Um, <laughs> So just to reiterate, I, you know, I think there's there's the physical mask, but there's also the metaphorical mask that, you you know, we, we underestimate how uh, how these are young people who often are really struggling in their relationships relating to others and actually just having that barrier in the way, uh, a physical barrier, but also a visual barrier uh, and a sense of, you know, being detached in some way is really significant. Um, on top of that, a huge issue is about not being able to do the family meeting that we would normally do in a normal way um, and so you know restrict it to one parent well often young people come from family where they're, they're not living with you know they, their parents aren't together and it's not quite si as simple as just one parent representing both parental views uh, we have situations you know that a very unwell young person that we've heard about where actually it was too much for one parent and it was a real struggle because that parent was going to become sick themselves they weren't sleeping they were terrified and actually you know we did need to show some flexibility kind of in the interest of safety of the parent um, and then a, a third point is the problem with that we rely on our community teams to enable discharge and uh, and trying to kind of work with them in a flexible way, working using kind of technology has been a real challenge because something that we really rely on is that the community teams can come and meet the young person, uh, form a relationship with them and safely carry them out into the community. And that's just not available uh, in this climate in the same way. So uh, an, an additional sort of challenge. Um, and I, I think that one of the things that we're probably all thinking about as you, those of us are parents is how do we, any suggestions that how we reduce the negative impact of or psychological impact of lockdown on the children that we may be at home with? Um, that's a really good question and one that everyone's asking, including me. Um, Mandy, uh, so Mandy um, Bryan is our head of psychology, so she might have some thoughts on this. It's such a tricky one, Jonathan. I wish I had a really good answer. I think that um, at the beginning, um, it, it, it was easier than it is now. Um, I think that um, what we were advising was maintaining structure, putting in a routine, um, uh, not not necessarily emulating school, but but letting people, letting children know that um, this was a different way of being, but it was all for the right reasons. Giving, containing any worries, and then supporting them with structure, um, changing variety of uh, of activities, etc. Not forcing school if it was too much. Being kind, 
Um, I am now increasingly called, and all the psychologists at Great Ormond Street, in that um, everybody's had enough. You know, <laughs> parents have had enough, children have had enough, and I think we are entering into the realm of the impact of negative uh, uh, psychological aspects impacting on mental health. Um, and that um, we've all been in lockdown for long enough now for it to feel like an imposition and it's getting trickier to be able to rationalise with even young children um, why this is still in their best interest. And I think that, you know, we've seen national debates over going back to school. I think that we just have to stick in there. We have to continue with this is what we're advised to do. This is, this is to keep you safe. Um, but actually now we're having to start to think a bit more creatively about um, the ways in which we structure a child's day, particularly younger children, um, that playing explorer um, around the house, trying to think of absolutely anything. And it's really impinging, I think, on parental mental health too, in terms of um, having to be um, mum, dad, uh, teacher, um, uh, in, in the cases of the children at Great Ormond Street, doctor, nurse, physio, dietitian, etc., maintaining all of those roles. So I think we are entering into a phase now where we have to start to feel and introduce some um, optimism and hopefulness into the children's lives and certainly into the parental lives in terms of being able to feel like there is a route out and things will get better and things will change. I think from a sort of national point of view, if you look at children across the board, you know, short periods of time like this may not, for, for many children, may not have a huge impact. But the ones that I'm really worried about are children, you know, from deprived areas. Um, we know already that background mental health problems are greater in lower income households. Um, and, they, and they also don't access services as well. So, you know, a lot of people have been behind closed doors as well for a long time now. So I think, you know, how different children respond to this will be different. Uh, and the ONS um, released some data this week, you know, sort of a significant chunk of adults now are saying that it's affecting their own mental health and their relationships. And that's really the only proxy data we've got at the moment on children. It's emerging, but it's what we've got. So I think um, Mandy's absolutely right. As long as it goes on, it's going to be more tricky. Can I just add something? Um, everything's really interesting in, in, that, in that regard from what Mandy's saying, but also there's something about... Uh, in, in my mind, there's something about um, appreciating and acknowledging just how difficult this is for everybody. Um, acknowledging it for ourselves as, as professionals, for ourselves as, as adults, potentially parents as well, and, and for the children as well to just be clear about the fact that we are all muddling through and there's something about validating the feelings of just how difficult this is. Um, just a, a simple thing. Okay, now that's, that's really helpful, thanks. Um, and I just I suppose a few things, if we if we can having more of these patients within the trusts and certainly patients that are um, detained under the Mental Health Act. Is there guidance anywhere for people that are, um, for example, having to do surgical procedures on them? And if, if someone's detained under the Mental Health Act, for example, who is refusing to have plastic surgical to some self-harm, for example, um, what is the legal position we're in from that point of view? John, can I drop that one onto you from a psychiatry point of view? Yeah, and uh, Mike can help with this because he's been dealing with the uh, Mental Health Act at UCLH more than we have here. Um, but basically, you know, normal consent issues apply. Um, and if it's, you know, a life-saving procedure or something, that can, that can go ahead. But children, can, children are allowed to refuse, uh, but parents can consent on their behalf. Um, and so parents can override a, a child's refusal. Uh, but obviously one also thinks about uh, their capacity to consent and so on, so that will come into it. And if they're detained under the Mental Health Act, they're likely to, to lack capacity. So you, you would act in their best interest, really. But Mike, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, so I think it, so. There's, uh, it's kind of the use of the Mental Capacity Act, which applies to over 16 and over. Um, uh, uh, there are the Children's Act, which is about acting in the child's best interest with parental consent if it's within the scope of parental responsibility or the old zone of parental consent. Um, and um, but also, and, and, and then the Mental Health Act allows you to treat uh, the young person's mental illness, not their, not physically. Um, and the question then is about whether their physical illness is what's called a symptom ancillary to their mental illness. So do you need to treat, uh, if you like, a physical repercussion of their mental illness, in which case it can be done under the Mental Health Act. But I think all, sometimes these are very complex decisions and they need a team to think together and to kind of work out and some familiarity with um, the kind of legal frameworks um, and really careful, open, thoughtful discussions. Um, 
yeah. I think what we've been trying to work on as a team, so I'll tell you two seconds, two seconds, but what as a team is just, you know, sort of treating young people who are with us for those mental health crises in a way that you would treat them or any other patient in lots of ways, you know, talking to them about what their concerns are. You know, there've been times where people have um, been upset because they haven't been able to get their operation because they've been told they're coming for their operation and they're being starved and fasted. So it's not any different actually from, from most people. It's, a, it's been about having to have conversations with people as you would ordinarily and not treating them any differently. And I think one of the things that's been really nice about this period, my observation is my colleagues have been like that. Um, to bring the best for these patients. There you go. <laughs> no, sorry, I was just going to add actually really similar to what you said is that I think in a, in kind of lots of other scenarios, you'd be thinking with the young person about how we can make it most manageable for them. We think really carefully about their kind of nursing intervention. So I suppose aside from like which legal framework to be using, I think we'd be thinking really carefully about how we can work with the young person, particularly from a nursing point of view, to make them feel as kind of safe, heard and contained as possible, uh, with the hope then that actually we can support them through that process without maybe having to use such restrictive kind of um, frameworks. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. And sadly, we're actually out of time. Um, we went through most of the questions that we had on Slido, but I'm sure that if anybody's got any burning questions they would like to ask, I'm sure Lee and John would be happy to take those directly our email if you need to um and i'd like to thank you very much to everybody on the panel and all our speakers i mean john yasmin kate sasha john and octavia it's fantastic i mean that's an insight into an area of medicine that i would certainly have um, really very little experiences at all um and and we've had about nearly 200 people um watching this uh grand round so that's fantastic clearly it's of interest to everybody in the hospital now and well done to you all for doing such a great job it's fascinating so next tuesday we are happy to welcome the ethics team. We're going to talk about the ethics around pandemics in children. And the week after that, we, the well-being team, we're going to be talking about the well-being of staff during a pandemic. So we've got a couple of really interesting looking brand rounds coming up after this one, which is going to be fantastic. Um, and we are going to finish there. And this is going to be recorded, edited and put on to the GLA uh, YouTube channel um, with some editing. And that will be available in probably in a few weeks. Okay, so thank you very much to you all. That's fantastic. Great. Cheers.